What's going on guys? Once again, thank you to everyone that bought some training that signed up for a course. I really appreciate you guys. Thank you for the nerd tribe and we're, we're feeling much better. Um, I've made some decisions that I'm going to talk about. One of the things that pisses me off is the level of you just do this newfangled thing, not work that hard, and you can make a lot of money doing this, whatever it is. Whether it's affiliate marketing or it's this or there's, so one of the things that I did is, you know, with YouTube, every video to the right has three little dots at the corner and you can hit those dots. And I've been hitting a lot of those dots because there are so many content creators I became a millionaire when I started to think like this. Not when I became a millionaire because I created the company. I, no, 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 no. We're, we're, we're not having those kind of conversations. Well, they're not having those kind of conversations. I'm having those conversations. So, uh, like I said, I'm feeling much, much better. I'm handling the moist men because essentially I had a few comments just block delete keep it moving versus getting into it because i'm getting ready to come out of my little break and i'm going to get into some deeper level of training because I, I'll, I'll i'll share some with you i have never started a business with credit I've never started a business with a loan. Never did that. And I've built multi-million dollar businesses. But with YouTube, there have people who have, and I'm not the only one that's done this. There have been a lot of entrepreneurs that have scaled their business up without credit or loans and built million dollar businesses or multi-million dollar businesses. I'm not the only one. But the messaging on YouTube is you cannot start a business without funding. And I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. If you start a business and your business is working, meaning that you have a product or service and you deliver that product or service to the customer and they pay you, and you're doing that at enough of a scale where you're making a lot of money, you don't need credit nor business. You don't need, you don't need credit to grow your business. I was watching a YouTuber who has three car notes, which is insane to me, which is just insane to me. Uh, he's a YouTuber, he's building a million dollar house, he's you know he's very much in the credit space. And I personally don't have any personal debt. I've got a little business debt, a little business debt. And I'm gonna share something with you guys about me. It pisses me off paying bills. I like that's one of the reasons that I sold the Mercedes. That's one of the cars I financed for the car rental business. I, I, I hated paying that bill every month. It just drove me nuts. And I was like, you know what? And I actually went to CarMax. CarMax gave me 35,000. I was able to sell that car to CarMax, get a check for 31,000. They paid off the rest of the balance. And I, I kept, mo kept it moving. Um, one of the things that I'm going to get into is teaching people how to start businesses and make money because when your business is working and you're making money, you don't need credit. Now, having credit like Christian Guzman, Christian Guzman, he recently did a video where he just got a line of credit for 7.5 million. 
and Christian has been in business seven, eight years, and he just got to that point. And I'm going to tell you something for some banks to give him a line of credit of 7.5 million. He's making millions and he built his business, a gym, an apparel line, an energy drink, and there's some other stuff. And he just got into credit. He built a gym. He built a, a apparel line. He did all this without credit because, um, like I said, if you go to YouTube and also with business credit, um, I have all my business credit at the holding company level. Now, when I had Mac Daddy Autos, I had a credit card for Mac Daddy Autos because it made sense. But I have other companies that I don't have any credit cards for. And I have no intention of getting any credit cards because once again, the management and the cash flow and the management of that stuff can get a little crazy. So once again, like I said, I have a bunch of credit cards and I, I'm in the state where I'm kind of gardening right now because uh, there's some stuff I want to go for next year and I've opened up too many accounts and I've been getting turned down because there's too many inquiries and too many open accounts on my credit profile. So I'm gardening at the moment. I am, I am just sitting back chilling and I want to teach you guys how to start a cash flowing business because you know, the storage auction business that cost me a lot of money, but my first business actually cost me zero dollars to get started. I had to go out and do an LLC. So let's say 150 bucks to get that business started. So we're going to be talking about business and how to make sales and how to develop products and stuff and make money where, cause like, once again, here's the thing that I, I consistently see here on YouTube. There are a lot of people who are lavishing credit and this guy, he has like 40 houses and his positive cash flow is like 20,000 a month. And I was just sitting there like, so the overwhelming majority of his rent money goes to service mortgages. And you know, as long as your renters always pay their bills and you don't have prolonged periods of time where your house is empty, I guess that works. But you know, OPM, other people's money, because this is something else I consistently see. Why use your own money? I've literally seen people use that phrase. Don't use your own money, use someone else's money. And really, there was someone who's invested a lot of borrowed cash in the cryptocurrency, which I think is one of the foolishest things you could do, one of the most foolish things you could do. Because cryptocurrency is highly speculative, it can, it's very volatile, and you're gonna borrow money to invest in cryptocurrency. I think that's just a bad idea, but you know, so like I said, we're, we're going to get into some different level of training, some different stuff. And like I said, um, once again, thank you to everyone that's bought a course. Thank you to the nerd tribe and let's get into this wonderful bean footage van life, the culture has shifted. Um, I was on YouTube and Instagram and I was looking. For me, when the thought of moving out of a house to live in a van so I could travel and I can go to city to city is not very appealing to me. Now, I'm from the old school. Road trips. I have literally visited 
Alaska, Hawaii. I have visited maybe 40 different states via car, road trips and stuff. Drive, visit, stay in the hotel. So I don't have that wanderlust that feels like a, like a, to me, when I think of van life, the second word that comes to mind is uncomfortable. Like being in the van. Van is gonna be super hot in the summer. It's gonna be super cold in the winter. And I feel that this whole narrative is being driven by millennials in the generation under millennials. These young people who want freedom. They want unbridled, unrestricted freedom, and they don't want to work a job. Um, when I used to have a job, and it's been 24 years since I've had a job, um, I never hated my job. I never had a job that I hated. Now, going to when I descended into homelessness and I started working at the labor pool. Now there were some jobs that I did that absolutely sucked, but from long-term regular employment, I never had a job that I hated, that I, I never was in that situation. But once again, it's a different generation. When I was a young boy, I couldn't wait to get a job. I couldn't wait to start working and earning some money. I just couldn't wait. The van life crew is very different in that regard. Now, there are certain categories of van life people. There are people who have good incomes and they spend 50 to $100,000 for these tricked out vans and they work really hard. And some people are doing this to save money. I was watching this one girl. She thinks she has a six figure income. She lives in the van and she's been able to save $50,000 a year for the last four or five years. So from a practicality standpoint, that makes sense. That makes sense. There was a guy, a firefighter here on YouTube who was living in his truck and he was making $85,000 a year. He saved a lot of money. So you have a group of people who have good incomes, good jobs, good career options, who are living in a van or a car so they can save a lot of money. Once again, that makes sense. But I also feel that segment of people who are doing that is the smallest category of van life. Because I feel that most of van life is driven by poverty, lack of money, lack of income. And we're going through a big culture shift where someone is expiring to live in the van. I'm going to say something that may sound um, a little dismissive. To me, living in the van is two steps above being homeless. To me, um, it's very, very close because this is one of the things that I personally could not do. I could not live in a van. Just couldn't. Now, I'm saying this from a situation of privilege. I live a pretty good life. So I don't have to live in the van. And also when I had my 5,000 square foot house, it never occurred to me to rent out. I had three bedrooms upstairs that were empty. Never occurred to me to rent out rooms. Never occurred to me. So I'm coming from a position of abundance. I'm coming from a position of privilege. And this whole van life being on the road with your dog or 
you, it's, maybe it's a man and woman and a dog. It just screams hobo to me that you have no roots, you have nothing going on in life, and you're living in a van, you, your dude, and your dog. And also, I'm starting to see a group of videos titled Leaving Van Life. Because once again, most of the people, and there are some older people who are living van life. There are some older people. But once again, most of this is driven by young people and you're seeing a lot of people come out those vans. Because, I mean, I believe that you're living in a van, you're homeless. Like I said, it's like two steps above living on the streets. Because one of the things is, you gotta keep moving in that van unless you have a place or a friend that lets you park in their yard or something, you're constantly moving. And these campgrounds are not cheap. These campgrounds, like, uh, I remember the last time I drove to Florida, there was these KOA campgrounds. They were all over the place. And for me, it's not romantic to be cooking on the tailgate of your truck or to be cooking outside because you live in a van. That just screams, once again, it's a small category of people who could live in a house. They choose not to live in the house and they choose to live in a van to save a bunch of money. Once again, I feel that it's smart, that's wise, but it's a sacrifice even for those individuals. But I feel that most of van life is driven by, I don't want to work a regular job. I've got, I think my Puerto Rican friends, I got the hot foot, my foot's hot, the hot foot, I think that's what it's called, where they want to go out. And once again, if you're really young, between 18 and maybe 29, and you want to go ahead and get a van and get on the road and discover the country, I feel that could be cool. However, here's the thing that I'm consistently seeing. Well, part of this is driven by the economy. The economy is a big reason that van life is exploding. Um, people, you know, like, like I said, there's levels to this. There's someone that will go buy a van off Craigslist, maybe a 1970, a 77 van, and they will funk it up and they'll put a, a sink and a kitchen in it and a, a stove and a little refrigerator, inverter, solar panels on it. They'll do that. And that is mostly from an income perspective. That's not, hey, you know, I live in a house, I live in an apartment, I wanna save some money, I'm about to get rid of my mortgage, I'm about to get rid of my rent, I'm gonna live in a van for three or four or five years. That is not the process that these people are going through. Process is, I don't have no money, and I'm gonna live in a van. And from a cultural standpoint, people are aspiring for two steps above poverty. And there's another channel, Bob Wells. I think the name of the channel is Cheap RV Living where Bob is an older guy, he's a YouTuber. Bob is probably 65 or 75 with his dog Cody, and he chooses to live in the van because based upon his YouTube income, Bob can easily afford to live in the house if he wanted to. If he wanted to live in the house, he could. And this whole notion of, when you live in a tiny space, Every time you do something, it is way more involved. Like, let's say I was in a van and I had to cook. So I've got to do way more extra steps than if I was cooking in a full-size kitchen. And I, this is some of the stuff that I don't see in van life. Because once again, for me, for me, it's 
very unappealing to be living in the van. I can, well, I can do this because I had a friend, older gentleman, who had an RV. Big RV, it was tricked out, had a king size bedroom set in it. I can do that, but I can only do that temporarily. Because here's the thing, living in a van is uh, a lot of work. Living in a van, you got to like, just something as simple as going to the bathroom. Um, let's say you have a case where you've got the runs and you're living in a van. That's gonna be very uncomfortable because every time the urge hits you, you gotta find some place to go versus being in a house or an apartment and literally just going around the corner. So I feel that if you get sick in the van, it's going to be hell. It's just going to be hell because you're not sick. You're not, you're sick. You're not feeling good. And then all of those extra things that you have to do, such as a gray water tank, a black water tank, you got to dump those things out. I think the gray water tank, I'm not hundred percent sure is where when you use your sink, you use your shower, that's where all that water goes. And then you've got to go somewhere and dump that. That's a procedure. And if you are a really clean person taking a shower frequently, you're gonna have to dump that tank maybe once or twice a week. And that, that's what I'm talking about, this whole, they make it seem to be so romantic because what you go to Instagram, put van life, and you will see these people out in the middle of nowhere, on the beach, the doors are open, and it looks so beautiful, and it looks so romantic. And I'm just like, I'm gonna say it, for me, being van life is trash life. Like I said, it's a few steps above being homeless, and I believe there's a group of people who are doing van life to save money, it's an option. It's an option. This one chick, I think her name is Christian Schaefer. She's a photographer. She chooses to live in a van, but she makes enough money if she wanted to, she could live in an apartment or a house. So that's a situation that you see. Um, there's this chick, Nikki Duvenval and her dog Camp Camper, living in a Prius, living in a Prius. And also, I feel that a lot of these people who are living in vans are not doing it for personal reasons. They're doing it to make money because just Google living off the grid, or just go to YouTube, off the grid living, van life. Um, Janelle, the, the black girl with the white snake, um, I forget his name. She made a lot of money off her YouTube channel, Living in the Van. Some of her biggest videos was like taking a shower. And I, I want you to think about this. That you have to go outside, hold a hose above your head to take a shower I mean, just the whole thing. You gotta put flip flops on, you're outside, there may be dirt, there may be gravel. I'm just like, no, 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 that, that doesn't even begin to sound even close to something desirable when you really start to think about it. And I feel that the van life marketing department because right now you have the van life marketing department, you have the Toro marketing department, you have the Airbnb marketing department. Because once again, if you want to get some real life responses to van life, Airbnb, Turo, go to Reddit, R-E-D-D-I-T, go to Reddit, 
because people go to Reddit to tell the truth and you will find so much counter arguments to van life, Toro, Airbnb. I mean, literally I was watching, reading an uh, uh, Airbnb thread and a lot of people decided to take their house off of Airbnb because here's the thing. When you're in Airbnb, you're in the hospitality industry. You're not in the real estate investing side. You're in hospitality, which means there's a lot of work. If you have an Airbnb that's getting three to four guests per week, guess what? Every time that guest leaves, you got to reset that Airbnb. And that's not easy. And I, I feel because uh, I was on the um, Reddit and there's a lot of crappy Airbnbs out there because people do not understand that they're in the hospitality industry. And for me, once again, for me, with my years of business experience, um, that's a crappy way for me. I'm just speaking for myself. It's a crappy way to make money. And speaking as a person who has made six figures in a month, it's not something that I would even consider. You know, maybe later on after my YouTube career is over, because someday this is going to be over. I'm going to stop doing YouTube videos. Um, and I want to sit back and maybe run a real estate portfolio. I might dip my toe in the short term rental. But here's the thing. First of all, if you're going to own short term rentals, like if I was in Florida and I was 15, 30 minutes away from Disneyland, I would consider short term rentals because there's a destination 15, 30 minutes away where I can get a bunch of people looking to stay in my Airbnb. But I was in Boise, Idaho. Uh, I don't know about Airbnbs out there, but I haven't done the research. But with these van life marketing department, the Airbnb marketing department, the Toro marketing department, and the biggest, most aggressive marketing department, the investing marketing department, they make things seem to be way better than they are. Like, once again, van life, um, personally, I would not do it. The most I can do is a full size RV. Cause you know, like when I came out that five, that like this place is 1700 square feet. That's the smallest I'm going. When I leave here, I'm going to go get another house. I'm not going to get 5,000 square feet. Cause that's just too big for me, for me. Probably be around 3000 square feet. Um, one of, the, cause one of the things that, you know, from being there, living there and knowing what that feels like and tastes like, I know that, you know, the next house is probably going to be 3000 square feet and the next house is probably going to be my last house. Um, just based on me and the way that I live my life, I don't need a bunch of room. When I moved in that house, I was using a good bit of that house. I was using the basement, I was using the other bedrooms, but going forward, I'm not going to be doing that kind of setup because I have an office and I'm probably going to keep an office, but van life is a sign of a cultural shift. Number one, I don't want to work a regular job. Number two, it's romantic being on the road, waking up next to the beach, opening up the doors and looking at the water. Um, like I said, this is driven by young people. And I'll share something with you. When I was in the military and I was 19, uh, I used to have sex with my girlfriend in the room with my two other roommates. What we would do is take our lockers and we set them a certain way where we could create these little compartments. 
Now, I couldn't do that today. I just couldn't do that. Like, I am not, it's like, no, 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 no. Mm -mm, couldn't do it. So I believe that age is a big, big part of van life, of people being part of this. And I feel during the global reset, in the recession, van life is going to continue to explode. Uh, because check out Bob Wells' channel and he would have a lot of older people. You have a lot of older people living in their car, living in a van, because they don't have no money. And um, I feel, personal opinion, that it would be sad for you to reach 75, 65, 75 years of age and be living in your damn car. I feel that it's sad because I don't think these people are doing it because they want to do it. They're doing it because they have to do it. And that just sounds like a miserable later stage in life move. It just sounds horrible. It just sounds horrible because 2019, if you didn't know, I had a heart attack and I recovered in the lap of luxury. I was in the 5,000 square foot house. I had plenty of room to roam. During the pandemic, I never felt enclosed or anything like that because there, there was three levels. So space is nice. You know, there's, there's such a thing as too much space and there's the right level of space because I'm probably gonna get a two level house, maybe three level house, maybe with a basement and um, enjoy the rest of my life. But this van life thing, it is like, if you want to get into a growth industry, anything to do with van life, whether you're making the components, the refrigerators, the solar panels, if you, anything where you can become a supplier of materials to van life people, or you can like, I can tell you, I can give you a business model that will make a lot of money. Go on Craigslist, find an old van and do the build and then sell it. Let's say you get a van for $3,000 and you go in and you recondition the engine and then you do a van, a build. You can sell that van for $20,000 easily. So let's say you put 6,000 in it, and you sell it for 20, that's $14,000. Uh, Cause there's a ton of people across the board who are looking for vans to live in. There's a ton of people. So you went ahead and, you know, cause I kind of think about doing it. I think about going ahead, running a warehouse and just going ahead and buying 10 vans and hiring a crew to start working on them and just start selling vans. I think about it, but once again, I look at the car rental business escapade and would that be something that I would enjoy? And the answer is no, because I wouldn't be doing any of the work. I would hire people to do the work and you know, the fabrication and building a van because number one, like I said, I understand the economics of van life. And like I said, once again, if you could, live that life for three or four or five years, you have a good job, you're making good money, you can save a lot of money. Once again, I feel that is a solid move for a wise person. But for me to set up this van building business or fabrication shop, I would never ever live in a van. So looking at the car rental business, I'm not going to long-term rent a car because financially it's insane. So I'm not going to open up the van fabrication shop. As much as I know it's a lucrative ideal, I'm just not going to do it because I would not live in a van. And I feel 
to create a business that's going to serve those customers well, you need to be someone that will live in a van. That way you would know all the ins and outs and I'm just not going to do that. Just like, once again, I did a video, 6,000 people per day are getting their cars repossessed. Um, credit repair for the next 10 years is going to be a growth industry. If you want, but once again, I'm not doing credit repair. Like I looked at it and you know, the whole thing was to get myself like three assistants to, and do some marketing on YouTube. And, and I'm just sitting there like, that's just not a good business. It's just not a good business for me because one of the reasons, like if you got in an accident, you were in the hospital for four or five months and your credit went bad, guess what? That is so easy to fix. Literally, if you were in the hospital and your credit went bad, you could send a copy of your hospital records to all of your creditors and ask for a goodwill adjustment and they will take all that derogatory stuff off your credit report because you did not get, your credit didn't go bad because you were a bum, your, your credit went bad because you were sick and they will take all that stuff off. So what about the folks who didn't get sick and spend months in the hospital? Bad money management practices. And you know, to start a legitimate credit repair business, you must render services before you collect money. So you must set it up where you're gonna go ahead and fix their credit and then invoice them after you remove stuff. I'm just like, that's just another high hassle, high touch business. And I'm about to say something that may come across as dismissive, maybe come across as mean. I don't want to work with poor people. I don't wanna work with them because that is the most neediest, hardest to serve group category of customers you can have. You know, if I had a shop in the hood, okay, fine, I, I can deal with it. But I am getting ready to revamp my business to move toward a more upscale clientele because like I said, during this break, I was just sitting there thinking, I know so much that I can teach other business owners and that's kind of where I'm gonna go with my products and services in the future. I'm going to have some self-paced courses for the beginners, um, you know, folks who are looking to get started. Folks, you know, like I said, there will be something for them, but the use of my personal time that's something that I'm gonna be, I'm, if you've noticed, I've been very, very careful. Like, I don't get on the phone and do a lot of consults. My consult fee, actually, I just, I actually got rid of the consult link. You can't even buy them or sign up for them because one of the things I've learned from business, like let's say I, I went ahead and started the van fabrication business. I would instantly hire people to do the fabrications because this was, once again, lessons learned from the car rental business. I made so many mistakes with the car rental business. I had the capital that I could have bought brand new cars, which have been less cars, but I wouldn't have had the uh, repair issues. And one of the things that I learned was I was too involved. I bought the cars, the cars were in my name, it's like, I'm just not doing any more businesses like that. Next business that I build, I will have employees doing stuff that would be standard operating procedures, that would be processes and systems, because this is how I made the most money ever made, by having systems and processes. And honestly, just keep it a buck. I'm not trying, I, I don't work that hard. I, I generally don't work that hard compared to the way that I used to work when I was much younger and the hours. I simply just don't have no desire to work that hard building a high cost structure business when I, once again, I'm about to press hard onto what I do well and what makes a lot of money 
without the high overhead. I am not down for a high overhead business. Just the storage unit business wasn't really crazy high overhead, but the overhead was real. $40,000 a month between rent, employees, truck leases. I, I'm not trying to do that anymore. And that's why, you know, even though I know that if you build a van fabrication business in the next 10 years, this is going to be a growth industry. You can do vans several ways. You could like, hey, we got this van. What kind of build do you want? You can do custom bills. You can take deposits from the customers so they can't walk away. It's like, hey, Mr. Customer, we're going to build this van to your specifications. This is a non-refundable deposit. So that way, if they flake, they just can't get their money back and then you've done all that work. So like I said, I feel that van life, van, anything to do with vans building, it's just going to be a growth industry because with the global reset and with the high inflation of rent, the high inflation of housing prices, uh, America's just being priced out of normal living arrangements. Unless you're up over middle class or rich, uh, it's a struggle out there. It is a struggle out there. And then this is another thing. Uh, this is part of the van life components. People are converting school buses into mobile homes, you know, schoolies as they call them. And to me, all of this stuff is just a few steps above poverty. Just a few steps above poverty. And I feel that if you go ahead and engage in that life, and if you're not careful, you're gonna get trapped. You're gonna be living in a car or a van for the rest of your life because luxuries once tasted become necessities. So yeah, like, like I said, um, personally, I'm all about meeting the standard to live the life that you wanna live in the current economic system. Um, that's what I'm about. And that's what I'm gonna, some of the stuff that I'm going to start teaching because during this recession, during this global reset is tons and tons and tons of opportunity, tons of opportunity for those who are willing to roll up their sleeves and put the work in tons of opportunity. Like I said, uh, I just gave you two like van life, van fabrication business going to be bumping credit repair is going to be bumping and consulting is going to be bumping for business owners who have a moderately successful business and they want to make it more successful uh, years ago I had my phone number on the channel and this is a program I'm probably going to bring back a consulting program for business owners ie you have a real business that has cash flow and it supports you not that you're trying to start a business. And I was charging like 1500 bucks a month and my, you know, cause people would call in and I would pitch them. My pitch rate was about 75%. So if 10 people called me, I would close seven. I felt that was pretty, pretty good. It was pretty good, but um, one of the things that I would build going forward is a sales team. Because once again, uh, I would get away from, it all comes back to me. That's no way to grow a business. So I would build a sales team and it would, these, these people would have to be highly paid for me to get what I want. I mean, minimum walking through the door is 50,000. Minimum, because I want someone who is making enough money where they can have a halfway decent life without stress or struggle. So, you know, look forward for that. But I'm getting ready to introduce some new stuff for October and everyone that buys the program will get this new stuff. Just letting you know. It's gonna be in the first comment or it will be in the description box. But yeah, man, van life is here to stay. It ain't going nowhere. It ain't going nowhere.